By definition, a storyteller conveys events in words, images, and sounds, often by improvisation or embellishment. The Living Bread Radio Network presents The Storytellers with Tony Agnesi. Today you'll hear a faith-based, inspirational story that's both heartfelt and heartwarming. And now, let's meet today's storyteller with Tony Agnesi. Hi, this is Tony Agnesi, and welcome to this edition of The Storytellers. Each week on The Storytellers, we feature a guest with a unique and inspiring story to tell. The Storytellers is brought to you in part by CatholicBook.net, and all of the books uh, featured on the program are available there. The program can be also heard via podcast at thestorytellersradio.com and wherever you get your podcast: iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Podbean, Spotify, and many, many others. And you can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, Pinterest, and MeWe at Tony Agnesi. My guest today is uh, Sarah Chris Meyer. She's the author of the book Becoming Women of the Word, How to Answer God's Call, with purpose and joy. And Sarah, welcome to the program. It's great to have you with us. Thank you, Tony. I am really glad to be here. I am excited to go through this. Obviously, as a guy, I did read through, and I am fascinated by the uh, women of the Old Testament, and I really want to get into that with you as well. But let's talk a little bit about you, and uh, I like to usually start the interviews uh, each week with uh, with uh, finding out about the author's own personal uh, faith journey. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Sarah. I was raised Protestant. I have a very large family, and just about everybody is a missionary or a pastor or a, you know, preacher, Bible teacher, Mm -hmm. uh, involved in full-time, sometimes uh, Christian work. And so, very strong Christian upbringing, and I, uh, in some of their eyes, maybe made a mistake by falling in love with a cradle Catholic (laughs) at some point (laughs) in my life. And uh, he had actually left the faith, which was interesting, and uh, came back to the Lord through, uh, I guess, through myself and some friends of mine, and went to church with us at a Protestant church. But after we got married and I got pregnant, he uh, suddenly all of his Catholic roots kind of came back to life, Mm -hmm. and he wanted to baptize the baby Catholic, go to Mass, all this stuff that was not in our prenup. (laughs) What so we used to what we used to call in the olden days a mixed marriage. Yeah, that's what it started to feel like, and I had not signed up for that. So it was a really difficult thing because um, I, I don't I don't think that we didn't think Catholics were Christian. Wow. Uh, we thought that a Catholic could be a Christian, but uh, in general, that a lot of things about the Catholic faith kind of kept you away from a relationship with Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't um, something that I had a good impression of, and it was definitely not something that I would want to pursue, and I didn't really want it for my husband as well. Mm-hmm. So it was very difficult. So what was, there um, had to be a turning point, though, right? There was a turning point, um, and I'll, I'll cut to the chase, because it was kind of a long story of how I got to there, but at one point I'm just beside myself, and I was uh, praying and praying, crying out to the Lord, and I hear I heard him ask me, Sarah, who brought you here? And when I realized that he had, I was so startled because I wanted him to take me out of the situation. So I kind of let him have it for that, and when I calmed down, I heard him again. And he I actually, in my mind's eye, I saw his hand reach out to me, and he said, I'm going this way. Are you coming? And I just had this realization that God had a plan for me that I knew nothing about and maybe didn't even like, um, but he was calling me mm-hmm. into the Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. And I was brought up that if God calls you to the jungles of Africa, you go. So <laughs> the Catholic Church had to be better than that. Yeah. And a lot, um, of, a lot of people have those callings and, and, and um, don't have the... And I don't know what's missing to 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 take that step in faith. Uh, but obviously, your upbringing caused you to take that step in faith because all of the commitments that people had made to Jesus calling that were in your family. Exactly. And you know, as I look back on it, I, 
I don't think it was only to become Catholic. I think it was also just to trust him with my life and to not follow my parents or, you know, the way I'd been brought up, but to trust God with my life. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that was, it was very, very hard, but in the long run, exceedingly rewarding. And I'm I'm very happy Catholic today, but it was a traumatic um, transition for me. At what point did you realize that uh, that uh, you not only were being led but but that that's exactly where you should be was, wow was there a I particular, never thought of that before was there a I'm particular not sure there was point? a point it, it you know for a while I just threw myself into studying the Catholic faith because I wanted to know what I would I believed as a Catholic mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's a big part of being a Catholic and as I studied, a lot of light started coming on, and I had always thought the Bible was wonderful. That was our sacrament, you know, kind of where we met Jesus. And when I began to read the Bible through a Catholic lens, it um, kind of uh, was like Technicolor or 3D or something. It, mm-hmm. it just exploded in beauty. And um, then I started teaching Bible to Catholics, and I, that's probably when I started, mm. when I really realized that was a good move. Mm. Let's talk about the book. The book is entitled Becoming Women of the Word. Sarah Chris Meyer is my guest. How to Answer God's Call with Purpose and Joy. I, I love the word joy. And, mm. and um, you know, serving with joy. Sometimes people uh, m- mistake happiness and joy together. I'm happy uh, when the Browns win, and I'm sad when they lose. I'm sure you feel the same way about the Eagles. But, uh, yeah. but joy is something different, isn't it? Serving with purpose and joy is something a little different. What's your take on that? I think that joy is, true joy is something that God gives us mm. in the middle of difficult circumstances. Um, you know, James talks about counting it all joy when we face various trials and so on. Mm-hmm. And the the underlying knowledge that we're in God's hands, that He has a plan, that He's in control, all those things, that, that can enable us to have a joy that's kind of like a steady stream, the, the current that's running underneath yeah. the water. Sometimes joy is sparkling, like the top of the water, but I think Christian joy is more something that hold you really steady underneath. What a beautiful explanation. That's wonderful. Uh, John 15, 11 says that my joy may be in you and that your joy might be complete. Wouldn't, mm-hmm. that, wouldn't that be cool, right, to have your joy yes. be complete? Well, you, you focus on women of the Old Testament, and I'm one of those I, I, I have to admit, New Testament kind of guys. I, I, I usually open the Bible to Matthew when I start. Um, why, mm-hmm. why women of the Old Testament? What, what, did, what, did, what do they have? What do they uh, have the ability to teach us that, uh, that uh, was attractive to you in terms of writing the book? Uh, a couple things. One is, um, while the women in the New Testament are get pretty brief treatment, they're you know, just a few verses mm-hmm. sometimes, mm-hmm. In the Old Testament, uh, we have whole chapters or even books that are dedicated to the life of a particular woman. Mm. And so you can kind of spend time with them and get to know them, and their humanity really comes out. And you can identify with these women that, who were among the first people who God got to know and let get to know himself. So there's a lot we can learn. Um, but one interesting thing to me, uh, especially as a, as a convert, I think, is my growing realization that these great women of the Old Testament foreshadow the Blessed Mother, um, just like Moses and David prefigure Jesus. Mm-hmm. And they help us to understand Mary's role in salvation. Um, they, sh- they show us uh, uh, quite a lot when you start looking at it from that perspective. So I, I don't see anybody doing that, and I wanted to take a look at it. Yeah, it's a, it's very unique and, and a wonderful thing. Was there one particular um, uh, woman of the Old Testament that kind of was the starting point or that you really uh, um, uh, you know fell in love with and, and, and uh, used that to kick off the uh, your study in order to bring all of this together? I had been studying quite a bit about... Rahab. Um, Rahab being the woman who uh, she shelters the spies when Joshua is bringing Israel into the Promised Land. And she's in Jericho. She's a prostitute who lives uh, in the wall, and she shelters the spies. And I was thinking about her because she is 
um, she's she's living in a society where nobody likes the God of Israel, mm-hmm. <laughs> that he's deeply unpopular. And when they hear that his people are coming toward them, you know, everybody is either getting ready to fight or they are cowering in fear. And she takes a look at the same facts that they see. They know who that God is, that he's king of heaven and, you know, Lord of heaven and earth. They look at what he's done in saving the Israelites, even 40 years before that, bringing them out of Egypt. And she looks at what he's promised to them, to give them the, the land, and decides on the basis of that that she's gonna, she wants to join them. Mm-hmm. And that knowledge of God's character and what he's done and what he's promised, that held her steady through the collapse of the city. And that's what saved her, and I think that gave hope to the, uh, the soldiers and everything of Israel as well. And it's to me, that's what gives me strength of faith, and what gives me hope is the, knowing those things about God. And so she's a, a wonderful, wonderful witness to us. Mm-hmm. Is she your favorite? Uh, as you as you put the book together, did one just jump out as, well, that's my favorite? Hmm. Well, yeah, every day you ask me that, I'll give you a different answer. <laughs> <laughs> today, Earlier today, I was thinking about Miriam, because, so Miriam is the sister of Moses, and she helps Moses and Aaron lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. And there's this little scene after the people cross over the Red Sea, she leads the women in praise and dancing with their tambourines. And if you sit just with that for a little bit and think about the implications, they have been slaves for ages. We know how, you know, backbreaking their work is, that Pharaoh had put on them. He wasn't allowing them any rest at all. I mean, who can relate to that, that you have, you know, you're busy all the time, you have no time for rest, no time to worship, you can't do what you want to do. And then their children are being killed. You know, they're under a great deal of stress. Mm -hmm. And... When they leave, they have to leave with barely the stuff on their backs. They're not taking anything extra. But they bring their tambourines, which they have made, and which they know how to play, which tells me that they have been playing them. Mm -hmm. And praise and thanksgiving are such, uh, such powerful weapons in our spiritual arsenal, I think. And often we praise and give thanks after... God helps us. And mm. they did that too. But the fact that they had those things makes me know that during their slavery, during the oppression, they were praising God. And that's what the Lord calls us to do and, and tells us to do. And it's such a beautiful way of conquering fear and anxiety mm. and <laughs> all these different things. Sure. So I I love that Miriam led the women in that. And it's it's interesting because they probably had some of the joy that you defined earlier, the joy, you know, even though you're just out of slavery and even though you're struggling and even though you're suffering as we all do from time famine, they still have time to to praise God and and uh, play their instruments. It's uh it's a wonderful story yeah. of, uh, of of the potential of joy. Wow. Sarah and I Chris- learned that. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. No. I learned that from my mother. Mm-hmm. Uh, I tell a story. Each one of these women in the book, I pair up with a woman who's had an impact on my faith. And in this particular one, I talk about how my mother led our family and a, a lot of their friends in these weekly or biweekly sings at our house where people would gather. And she had the auto harp, and she would lead us in praise and singing before we would pray and eat, whatever else we did. Mm-hmm. But I, what I knew that other people didn't know who were there, you know, they think we're just having a joyful time, but I would be privy to the burdens my mother was carrying and the difficulties and so on of life, and she did not only pray then, I mean, sing then, she'd be singing around the house, doing the dishes or vacuuming or whatever. She would pray in the middle of trauma and, mm. <laughs> you know, horrible situation, sure. and I would see her praise and sing, and I saw how that transformed her. 
what that's a, where I learned it. What a wonderful life lesson. Sarah Chris Meyer is my guest. Her book is Becoming Women of the Word, How to Answer God's Call with Purpose and Joy. It's published by Ave Maria Press, and we'll be back uh, to talk more about Becoming Women of the Word with Sarah Chris Meyer in just a moment. CatholicBook.net is your source for all things Catholic. With a large selection of unique items, we are here to serve the Lord by serving you. Visit our local shop in Canton at St. Raphael Books and Gifts, 4365 Fulton Drive Northwest. We are your source for all things Catholic. CatholicBook.net, for 30 years, a commitment to service. Welcome back to the Storytellers. This is Tony Agnesi. Sarah Chris Meyer is my guest. She's a Catholic author, speaker, adjunct faculty member at St. Charles Borromeo Seminary in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She is the co-developer and founder and editor of the Great Adventure Catholic Bible Study Program. She's written a bunch of stuff for a lot of uh, different uh, publications and, uh, and, and books. Her latest is Becoming Women of the Word, How to Answer God's Call with Purpose and Joy. Sarah, um, is there is there a message? You know, I, I'm I'm picking up on a lot of great messages here from our first segment. Is there a particular message that you want a, a listener uh, readers of this book to come away with? Yes, uh, a couple of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of them is whatever you're going through, whatever you know is going on in your life. God is greater. God, God has it. He has a plan, and you can trust Him. Mm-hmm. Because faith depends on who God is, not on who we are. So I'm hoping that if I have in any way made these women of the Old Testament approachable, I hope that I have also made God approachable in Scripture, and that people will work more to get to know Him uh, through His Word and to be strengthened that way. You know, we're all going to go when, through hard times, right? All of it. if Absolutely. we have if we haven't gone through them, just wait. You, we we will, and and it's these types of stories and and uh, successes, if you will, that that kind of help us in our faith journey to say, you know, I'm going through some hard times, but if you know the Lord can get me to it, He'll get me through it, and so forth. And I think that's uh, that's a beautiful message, uh, beautiful message from the book. Yeah, you just made me think. Um, recently, I was going through something, and I'm just thinking, I, there is nothing in me that can solve this problem. I don't know how to solve it. I don't have the ability. I don't have any friends who have the ability. I can do nothing, and I just start to panic. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's at times like that when you have to, you know, you look at Judas' prayer or at, um, you know, it, these people who have been in situations where the where it's absolutely impossible, and they say, "But wait a minute, God delights in showing His strength through weak people. You know, mm-hmm. we may be weak, but He is strong, and we need to give it over to Him and wait." And their stories show us that we can. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just, I am so grateful that I know that because it's hard enough to trust when you do know it. <laughs> you it, it is. Don't have the example. What do you do? I don't know. Well, that's a that, and I mean, you know, that's a whole another uh, uh, question. And you know, with what's going on today, 2019 in society, with so few people, um, um, you know, we're we're losing uh, Christianity in general, Catholics and Protestants alike. Uh, uh, church attendance is is down. It's below twenty percent in many bigger cities, around twenty twenty two percent elsewhere. And uh, I, I often wonder what what. How do you know? And I know suicide rates are up, and mass shootings are up, and all of those things. I'm probably going down an area we don't need to be going down. But how do we get to people? You know, I, I, how do we get to people that we that that have no um, um, sense of uh, when I can't get it done, I've got to turn it over to God. I, I I don't know how do we how do we get there. Well, I think what you're doing is a great thing because stories 
can have such an impact, far more than just kind of didactic teaching. You know, there are people who are open to didactic teaching and who want it, but it's the stories of people's lives that impact others. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that I hoped to do with this book, by telling stories from my life and from the life of women who I know and pairing them up with these Old Testament stories, I'm really hoping that it will spur people on who read it to think, oh, yeah, well, you know, my grandmother taught me this, or my neighbor, Mm -hmm. or God has done this in my life, and to think about how to tell that to other people. Um, I don't, if you read the book, you might think my family's extraordinary. I think they're not. They just told the stories, and over time, the stories get told again and again, Uh, So we remember, we remember what God has done for us, Mm -hmm. and that's such an important thing to pass that on. And basically the stories of the Bible are things, even, you know, Jesus was a storyteller, you know, he... He gave mm-hmm. us uh, parables, and, and the neat thing about parables were not only were they relatable stories, but they, they get us to a message that we remember, you know, we remember the message of the, of the, uh, of the story. And I think that, that holds true in all of our families, you know, in, in my first two books I talk about, I'm a, I'm a product of a, a storytelling family, you know, my grandmother mm-hmm. was a storyteller, my mom was a storyteller. And like you, there are a lot of uh, people in my family whose stories, you know, resonate, you know, 50 years later, you know, and, uh-huh. uh, and the idea that you could pair those with people of the Bible as you've done, or as you've done with the women of the uh, Old Testament with family members, to me, uh, just kind of makes sense. And uh, it, it, really is, it really is exciting to be able to do that. And, and you're right, they're not necessarily that they're all that extraordinary, but the, but the stories become part of, you know, of, of the interweaving of our lives. And, uh, and uh, getting that to people, getting that message to people is, is wonderful. You mentioned a couple of the, um, a couple of the Old Testament uh, women, um, and you paired them up. Give us, a, give us an example of, a, of another one or two, uh, just for the benefit of those people who are tuning in. You mean that are paired up? Yeah, that are paired up. So an obvious pairing is Queen Esther, who is the young girl who is living in exile at a time when uh, the Jews have been exiled up to Babylon, I mean mm-hmm. to, yeah, to Babylon. And the king banishes his one wife, and he's looking for another wife, and he chooses Esther out of all the beautiful young women in the world. So... She is a young Jewish girl who gets taken into the harem, and she becomes the queen, and probably not a place where she wants to be. Mm -hmm. You get taken away from all your friends and everything, and you stay in the harem, and if the king doesn't call for you, you never go out of it. Mm -hmm. Um, But she had favor with him, and during that time while she's there, she, um, her people are threatened with being wiped out, and she suddenly is in a position where she could potentially say something. So her uncle, you know, suggests that perhaps she was, you know, she's been put there by God for such a time as this. And she's afraid because you don't go to the king and talk to him. You have to be summoned, and if you go and talk to him and he's not happy, he kills you. Mm. (laughs) So she fasts and prays, and she ends up you know, asking the Lord to help her, and he gives her courage, and she's quaking in her boots, but she dolls herself up, and she goes in there and ends up actually saving her her people. Saves the people. So the, the story that I paired with it is a time when my mother is nine years old, and they are living in, um, in Shanghai, and mm-hmm. the communists are about to invade, and they can hear cannons in the distance and the Soldiers are marching on the roof next door, just getting ready to receive them, and everybody's kind of preparing to die. <laughs> they wow. don't know what's going to happen. Wow. So the, the missionary families have the children putting on plays to keep them distracted, and this week they're doing the play of Esther. And my mother got the role of Queen mm-hmm. Esther, even over her older sister. So, of course, she's really touting that, you know, playing it for all that she's worth, because she gets to be the queen. She's learning all the lines and wearing her dress and getting all excited. So the night that um, Mao's army comes up to the edge of town, uh, they gather around and they're praying. In in their family prayers, they go around the circle 
So each person has to take a turn and say a few words. And it came to her, and she's very embarrassed because she cannot think of anything to pray. All she can think of the lines for her from her from the play mm-hmm. that basically says, you know, if we perish, we perish for thee. And um, she remembers that God has brought her there. You know, God may have brought us there for such a time as this. And if we perish, we perish for thee. Wow. And she just felt stupid, but her parents later on said that that reminder that they were there in God's hands and that he was in control of the storm, of the war, of everything, that that kind of held them through the, through the night. And uh, while well, the bombs fell all around them and their building actually was spared. Wow. Um, which it wasn't necessarily, you know, that might not have happened, but it really held them steady. Those words of God brought to them from their daughter, held them through. Mm. You do have an exceptional family there. <laughs> Talk a little bit about uh, uh, spiritual mothers. I mean, uh, you know, we have uh, uh, spiritual mothers in the Old Testament in faith and mothers in faith, but how, how can the everyday people in our lives become sp- our spiritual mothers? So, you know, some women are biological mothers, but all women have this innate spiritual identity, I think, that enables them to be spiritual mothers. Mm-hmm. And it's a, it's a similar thing, just as you, you know, biological mothers nurture and love and raise and teach and encourage children. Um, the spiritual motherhood is a very similar thing. And just as mother, biological motherhood begins with receiving that child inside of you and giving it flesh and so on, I think that spiritual motherhood starts with a receptivity to the Word of God. Mm. It takes flesh inside you, and in the way that you are bringing Christ to the, lo- to the world, you are acting like Him with other people. You know, you are nurturing, forming, teaching, mm. speaking truth, encouraging, comforting, all those different things. Mm. That is, you're really being a spiritual mother when those things are the fruit of your relationship with Christ and your receptivity to the Word and to the Spirit and allowing it to overflow from you. Sarah Chris Meyer's been my guest. Becoming Women of the Word is the book, How to Answer God's Call with Purpose and Joy. Sarah, this has been a pleasure having you with us. Thank you so much for joining us. You are welcome, and it's been a great pleasure for me, too. I'm so pleased to have met you, and thank you for the opportunity. And that's our show for today. If you missed part of the program, the show will be available immediately following at thestorytellersradio.com and wherever you get your podcasts, including iTunes, Google Play, and Spotify. Later this week, it'll be on the Catholic podcasting site, breadboxmedia.com. To find out more about my books or to inquire about booking me to speak at your parish or conference, you can go to my website, tonyagnesi.com. My thanks again to Sarah Chrismeyer, author of the book, Becoming Women of the Word. This is Tony Agnesi inviting you to join me next week at the same time for another edition of The Storytellers. God bless. We hope you've enjoyed today's edition of The Storytellers with Tony Agnesi, a production of the Living Bread Radio Network in Canton, Ohio. To learn more about today's storyteller, go to thestorytellersradio.com. There you can subscribe to the podcast and hear all of our past shows. And join us again next week at this same time for The Storytellers with Tony Agnesi.